All right, welcome everybody to today's CSP seminar that's sponsored in part by KLA and LGAI, and we thank them for our sponsorship. Uh, today's speaker is Joao Pereira from uh, IMPA, the uh, Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics in Brazil. In case you're curious uh, how he's on the seminar se series, one of the reasons is that he actually applied to a faculty position in the last cycle, and he was kind of on our short list for phone interviews. Um, but then he ended up taking this faculty position in Brazil before we had a chance to convince him that University of Michigan would be the place, best place ever to work. And so anyway, so we thought we'd at least get to hear what he's working on, have a, a seminar from him. So as a way of biographical background, he got his PhD from Duke University. And then he went on, oh, excuse me, from Princeton University, I'm sorry, in, in applied and computational mathematics. And then he went to Duke as a postdoc in ECE, and then another postdoc in uh, at Odin Institute in, in uh, UT Austin. And he's going to, instead of the imaging work that attracted our attention uh, when you applied, you're going to talk about your uh, some of this more fundamental statistical uh, estimation work, I think. So we're looking forward to your presentation, and welcome. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for your invitation, Jeff and Kim, for the invitation to speak here at the CSP seminar. And uh, so uh, a good thing about this is, uh, which it's a pro uh, work that really, I think it's really interesting, is that it, it I wouldn't, if, if it was last year, I would not be presenting this, because this was something that was published in February. And so it's nice that I'm presenting this now. I'll also talk a little bit about the imaging problem, in particular, like a little bit of what I did in that problem and how it relates with the method of models. And so I'll get to that. But so I'll start a little bit motivating the method of moments, the main thing here. And now we, so uh, what I'm trying to bring to say is trying to bring method of moments back in, uh, in some settings. Uh, using this idea of implicit computation. So first, so there's going to be two things I'm going to focus here. One is going to be on the theoretical side, saying that in some cases, actually, the method of is like the best things you can do. And then on the, this is on the theoretical side, and it's using things from statistics and, um, and, um, and information theory. But then on the practical side, we also are starting to have ways to, to, to calculate, to use the method of moments in practice. And it, it's something that is very recent, as I said, it, it was published in February. And uh, the ideas of the implicit computations came before. Actually, one of my co-authors was the precursor the, who thought about this. And so I, I really think that on these two sides, it, like there's a, a place for using material moments in practice as, a, as an alternative to other methods like expectation simulation, for instance. And so to give a little bit of the overview of what the talk is going to be about, the talk is going to be about the, so on first, I'm going to talk a lot, a little bit about my, First, I'm going to explain what are the method of moments, of course. And then after I'm done with that, I'm going to give a, a, a motivation that at least for me is interesting from a theoretical point of view of the method of moments. It's something that shows up when you look at uh, the sample complexity of, of problems with very low signal to noise ratio uh, in the regime of very low. So problems with very high noise, uh, we see that in these kinds of problems, the method of the moments appear in the sample complexity. And that motivated me a lot to start thinking about these method of moments. And then I, we started thinking, how can we do method of moments in a way that is efficient? And uh, so the, I'm going to spend, because I can't explain everything, I'm going to spend most of this talk talking about this practical implementation of method of moments. And I'm going to focus more on that paper. But I'm also going to mention some things for this sample complexity uh, problem and also mention in the end, if there's time, a little bit on a similar problem I worked on that is related to the method of moments, which is symmetric tensor decomposition. And, and uh, so first, to motivate the method of moments, so we, we a lot of times we want to make sense of data. We have some data points here. I mean, as an example, we have data points in two dimensions and these data points have some uh, some structure behind them and we really want to understand them. We want to figure out things about them. 
And so a lot of, a lot of, most of the time what we, the first thing we do is try to fit models to the data. And so one thing we can do is try to fit the probability distribution to the data. And there's a lot of methods to do this. And so by doing the probability distribution, you get, can get some good ideas. Like by, by fitting this probability distribution, we can figure out that there's kind of three clusters, right? There's three points with more probability. And this gives us a, a little bit of the idea of how, how the data is distributed and we can extract information from that. Um, and one of the distribution, probability distributions that then everyone wants to try to fit to the data is the Gaussian mean, is the Gaussian distribution. It's like uh, when there's noise, everyone says it's Gaussian. It's the first thing that comes to mind. And so everyone knows a little bit, knows the Gaussian distribution, but for the sake of uh, completeness, let me go over it. So the a Gaussian distribution is a multi, I'm going to talk about it multivariate Gaussian distribution. It has some mean, which is a vector, uh, and the covariance, which is sigma. The probability distribution function is given by this formula on the left. And uh, this is what uh, the PDF looks like in two dimensions. And so this, this distribution has some nice properties. Like it's the limit distribution of a sum of random variables. It minimizes some entropies in some other, in, for some, other kinds of distributions, it's symmetric around the mean. And it's uh, it's also nice to model because it only has two parameters. One is like the mean, which is the first moment, and then there's the covariance, which is the second moment. So it only has these two parameters. So it's a, a nice distribution to, and it's very well understood in, in a lot of cases. But so if you try to fit the Gaussian distribution to the data that we had, it really doesn't capture everything. It's just like, if there's only one cluster and like you see that there's, this is not really the right probability distribution for the data. And so you want to fit another model to the data. And another model that we're going to focus a lot in this talk is called the Gaussian mixture model. And the idea of the Gaussian mixture model is that uh, the data comes from a mixture of Gaussian distribution. What is a mixture is, at each, you have some clusters, and to, to sample each uh, an element from each cluster, you f f first pick a cluster from a categorical distribution. We, you pick a cluster with some probability lambda j, and then from that cluster, you sample a gauge with some mean and some covariance. And, um, and so a Gaussian mixture model, the probability distribution function looks a little bit like this. So here, the lambda j's are going to be the proportion of the j component, the lambda j is sum to one, and then uh, there's the mean and the covariance for each standard. And, um, and so if you do fit the Gaussian mixture model to the data, you'll see that it actually looks very nice. It makes sense because I didn't tell you before, but the data actually came from a Gaussian mixture model. So it makes sense that uh, data, the Gaussian mixture model fitted to the data looks well. And so a lot of, in a lot of cases, we have these models for the data. And, um, and we want to find the parameters for these models. And, um, a lot of, and uh, what I'm going to focus today on is on trying to use the method of moments to finding the parameters for all these models. And um, in a way that is more efficient than actually forming this moments that you need to. Um, so also other thing that we want to do is that is to have something that works very well. So I'm thinking about moments and these moments can be quite big. But we, what we really want is something that works for samples which are very high dimensional and a lot of them. So you need to have something that uh, so ideally, we get something that scales linearly in the number of samples, because that's more or less also how, it's, how the, the sample complexity of the, of, um, the method of uh, calculating a moment. And you also want something that scales at most, like the squared of the dimension or cubed. And there's going to be some things here that are going to be scaled like a cube. If it's too much more than that, then it, it, it becomes unpractical. And so we want things that don't scale as much 
so so high with the, the dimension and really are like linearly in the number of cells. And, um, and so to explain method of moments, a lot of times people understand there's the mean at convariance, but if there's higher order moments, these involve tensors, these involve symmetric tensors. And so let me first explain symmetric tensors as a way to understand the notation behind the method of moments. I think it, it will be more easier to understand the, these higher order moments if I explain some tensor notation. So tensors, you can think of a tensor as a higher order table. So when n equals three, when d equals three, the, this is a cube of numbers. When n equals four is a four hypercube. And so you have this cube of numbers and we're going to, to think about cubes that actually have all the dimensions. So they're really cubes in the sense that all the dimensions in all the, the modes are the same because there are tensors that don't have this property, but in particular, the, the tensors we're going to think about, which are symmetric tensors, have this property. And so D is going to be the order of the tensor. It's going to be the number of dimensions. So if it's a cube, cube it's order three. If it's a hypercube, it's order four. And then this is going to, tensors also include scalars, if you think about d equals zero, vectors, which when d equals one, when the order is one, and matrices when the order is two. And so in this talk, all the dimensions, because I'm going to be focusing on symmetric tensors, all, over all the modes, over all the dimensions of the tensor, it's all going to be the size n. And then the number of entries of a tensor of this dimension is going to be n times n times n, n to the power of d. So n to the power of d is the number of entries of this tensor. And now we're going to think about tensors that are symmetric. So symmetric tensors are, they're symmetric over all the d factorial permutations of the tensor. So for tensors of order three, there are six permutations, ijk, ikj, j, 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 j i k, all the six permutations that you see in the screen uh, are the, the permutations that, and the tensor is symmetric over all indices, this is true. Um, and so one thing that's going to show up is that um, these, um, so we want something that doesn't involve forming these tensors because as for higher order, tensors, we have these huge cubes, which is going to be n to the d. So imagine your samples are of dimension n, a tensor of order three as n to the cube. So it's something that we really don't want to form because we want to do n squared at most n cubed, but we really don't want to form all these huge tensors and we want to do calculations without it. And uh, so, let me give some more properties about these tensors. You can actually do dot, dot products with these tensors as you do with other, um, other quantities. These dot products are, um, are, you can just do sum over all indices, do the product of all the, the indices and sum. It's like uh, Frobenius inner product. And uh, you can define the norm as the Frobenius dot product of the, of the dot product between a tensor and itself. And as all dot products and all norms, there's this property that everyone knows. This, this property is going to show up afterwards. So the norm of the difference between two tensors is the, equal to the sum of the norms minus their two times their dot product. And uh, finally, there's something else I want to talk about tensors, which is this before I go to method of moments, which is the outer product between tensors, which so for matrices, if you have a, a, a vector B and you make B times B transpose, you get a symmetric matrix, which is actually a rank one. This is out of product of B with itself. And now you can take the, its cube multiplied by B on the other side, and now you get the tensor of order three, which can also be thought of as the tensor of rank one. And uh, this is also a symmetric tensor. Um, because the, all the entries in it are the, the products of bi times bj times bk. And you can see that aijk is going to be equal to a 
A-I-K-J, A-J-I-K, and so forth. And so you can do this for any order and you get this tensor power of a vector to the power of D gets you a, tense, a symmetric tensor of order D. Now we're going to use this definition to define a, a higher order moment. And so the first moment of a distribution is just the expectation of the vector that gets you a vector, which is a tensor of order one. Uh, each entry of the vector is the expectation of the i coordinate of the random variable. So think uh, ran vector random variables and uh, within the, of dimension n. So the i moment is going to be, the i entry of this moment is going to be expectation of x i. Now you can think of second moments, which is expectation of x times x transpose. Uh, that's going to be a matrix, which is and the entry of this matrix ij is going to be expectation of x i times x j. Uh, so this corresponds to the covariance plus mu times mu transpose. And now you have the first moment, second moment. They are defined in a way that is it's really easy to see where this is going. We're going, the third moment is just going to be the expectation of X to the Q. And this is also a symmetric tensor. The IJK entry of this tensor is the expectation of XA, XI times XJ times XK. And uh, I did this for third moment, but I can actually do this for any order that I want. And so the, we have these expectations of X to the D. And uh, what we can do now is the following. So, the empiric, the if we with if we think of the distribution of the x to the d by the law of large numbers, this x to the d tensors, as you get more and more, this is going to converge to the expectation of the random variable you're looking for. And so the method of moments consists of matching these empirical x empirical tensor moments to the model moments that we're looking. Of, of the distribution. And so if you have some model moment, which is you have some random variable that that uh, follows some probability distribution that is parameterized by some parameters theta, you get this IR tensor, which is a symmetric tensor, which depends on theta. And now we have this empirical moment, which is just the average of these powers of the samples. And the method of moments is just minimizing the distance, the L square distance between these two, where this norm is just the defined norm that I defined beforehand of the norm between these two moments. And um, so this is the method of moments. Um, it's quite simple to define. And it, the it has a problem which we're going to overcome, which is forming these tensors. But otherwise, it's something that you just you can form them. If you can just form them, you can just calculate these things and then do gradient descent. And it's a different loss than the likelihood, for instance. So you can just try to optimize these loss and see what you get. And sometimes it might be better than just maximizing that. So you're going to just pick one um, tensor or order, whatever you call it, D here. You're not going to use combinations of first, second, and third moments. You're going to pick one. You one. can also, uh, so you can also use more orders. That's actually a good idea. In our paper, we use a, a, a way to combine them. Because so I'm going to go over that at some point. Because you okay. can't you can't use only one. Because there's this ambiguity that uh, if you only use one, you can't really solve for it. So you have to use more than one. And you have this idea that does this in an implicit way. But you can actually sum also more than than one. Okay. But I'll, I'll I'll talk more about that later. But so. Going back now to a little bit of the theoretical motivation of the sample complexity of, uh, of the method of moments, it's a motivation for me has been priorian. And so priorian is a problem in biology where- hey, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, so for the method of moment, uh, if you're like, so if you choose a, the order of the moments very high, uh, is that your sample could be, your, your like require a lot of more samples than you estimating lower order tensors? Is there any trade off? Because 
for example, for just a, like, I mean, a Gaussian is controlled by the first two moments, but uh, if you consider like a four order, like a fourth order, it could be very heavy tailed and then the samples needed could be higher, right? so. Yes, yes, so you, you don't want to do a lot of high orders because of that, but um, so I'm going to, one thing that I'm going to talk about in this next thing is going to be, sometimes you do need to do that, nevertheless. Like, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, the, in a second, but, uh, but it's true. You don't want, so the more orders you get, the more error you're prone to do. Other thing you can do is try to weigh less, the, the higher order moments less, put less weight on them because they're less, less. Uh, so if you're doing something where you're not minimizing really only one moment, but uh, you're putting the weight in each moment you're minimizing, then maybe you can do some weighting to, to some smart weighting where the higher order moments, because they're less exact, you don't want to weight them too, too much. Okay, thank you. Um, but um, so going back on the this uh, actually, is there any more questions about these method of moments before I proceed? I should have asked this before, but now that I asked, there's no question. <laughs> um, now, so the, a little bit of my motivation behind the. Um, method of moments has come from Prairiem and my work in my PhD, where, so Prairiem is this problem where um, you have these molecules that stand on a thin layer of ice. Um, and then what you have is pictures of this, these molecules over, you have, so you have these molecules that you obtain with, with some biological technique, copies of the same molecule, and now you freeze them really fast and you freeze them so fast that they don't have time to conform over different orientations. You, when you take it, and when you take a picture of them from above, you, any molecule are, these molecules are over random orientations, but you can just, you don't know the orientations of the molecules because each molecule has a different orientation. You can also not tilt the, the, the molecules because if you do that, the first time you take a picture, the molecules get destroyed. So you really can't actually tilt it because the molecules are already destroyed. So you, you only get one shot of a molecule per, per rotation. So it's a little bit like multi-reference uh, uh, MRI um, where we have uh, pictures of uh, projections of the, uh, some objects over different rotations with the difference that we don't know the rotation. So here, rotations is another step we have to estimate. So, or like think of uh, um, a Gaussian mixture model, but you don't know the clusters. So part of the Gaussian mixture model is figuring out the clusters. The M does like this waiting for where, what is this cluster. And in EM, there's also a similar EM step. And by the way, uh, the cryo, the EM in cryo EM is a different EM than expectation maximization. <laughs> but the EM, uh, so there's an expectation maximization cry, in cryo EM where it actually weighs every orientation a little bit like in the Gaussian mixture model sense to, to to construct the model. And that's more or less how it works in cryo, cryo EM. But um, but and this is a very important technique they got the. Uh, Nobel Prize in 2017 in Cramstreet. It was awarded because of cryo uh, But the problem of cryo is that the images are very noisy. One of the problems, cryo is a, a, a several problems, but one of them is that the, the actual images are very noisy. Uh, I don't know if everyone found the molecule. There's a molecule in there. Uh, it's over here. I don't know if everyone saw it beforehand. I, I, I showed it, but uh, it's really hard to see. This is a real image that, uh, so the molecules are really hard to find and there's there's a lot of noise, but you do have a lot of samples. And now we went, we went and studied this regime. If you have a lot of noise, but also a lot of samples, what is the sample complexity of your problem? And, um, and 
let me talk, explain a little bit what is the sample complexity. Sample complexity is a number of samples you need to, in this case, to get the molecule. So uh, it's a question I, you, you can ask me. So I have this mo statistical model for cryo-EM. Let's say it's a nice statistical model. You have, um, I, I give you, I want this, this much error. Tell me how much number, the number of samples you need. So you get at most this error. And this is a, a problem that is being studied in statistics. And it's uh, to obtain this sample complexity, it depends only on the statistical model for the data. It does not depend on the algorithm and the estimator you use. It's basically say, what is the best thing that any algorithm can do? And it's something that you don't really obtain using an algorithm, you obtain using tools from statistics and information theory. And uh, so we ask, what is the sample complexity of prior letter microscopy? And uh, a little bit about the sample complexity is that I, I really like to, to, to do this and obtain these bounds of sample complexity in a lot of problems, not only this one I studied, because it, it's really a good way to get uh, nice things. Like you can get uh, an idea of how your algorithm is working compared to what to any algorithm could do. It also can give you some idea of developing new algorithms. But so when we started going, going back to the cranium problem, what happened is that the sample complexity was, was given by the moments. And so explaining this in a way that uh, can be a little bit intuitive, but not going too much into the details, is that uh, this uh, sample complexity ends up being related to this geometry of the some F divergence and KL divergence between different probability distributions where the, the probability distribution for each different parameter. And what we observe is that this for the problems of cryo-EM and similar problems where the noise is very big, what happens is that this KL divergence is going to be at have a Taylor expansion. And the, the cellular expansion is going to be depend, depending on the moments. So the first term that is going to appear there is the norm between different the moments for different parameters, where the D, the order that appears here is the first order where this moment is different. And so to give an example with prior EM, so in prior EM, if you have, if it's, let's say you want to distinguish between two molecules in this regime, the first moment tells you about uh, this uh, average energy of each molecule. So it's easier to, it's harder to distinguish molo molecules with the same energy. For molecules with the same energy, you have to go to the second moment. And this gives you some information about the norms, but it's still not enough. And so you need third order moments for cryogen for sample complexity. And so this is, I'm answering the question I had uh, some time before. This, this is a, a little bit uh, pessimistic, but because it, this is the best you can do, you have to take the, you have to think about this. So you really need third order moments, which really means that you really need a lot of samples to estimate this for, for cryo-EM, but on the other hand, it's just, it's the best way you can, you can do. There's nothing else you can do. You really need a lot of samples and there's no way going around it. Maybe there is if you consider a smaller, uh, a smaller model, maybe with some sparsity constraints for the um, some coefficients of the molecule or something. But otherwise, you still have this this problem of um, having to look into these very high IR moments and needing a lot of samples. Test. And this motivated me uh, to me a lot to to think about method of moments because. When these involve higher order moments, then involve tensors. And there's still a lot of work to do on these tensors and how to do this in a nice way. And so that's why I started thinking about it. And I thought it was a really important problem because these problems where there's a lot of noise and you really need, so in this case, you need to go over moments. And in problem, so in prior EM, the problems involve this group action. And so these moments are related to invariant theory. And so you really need to think about how to go from the very problem and solve it using these moments. I think it's something that I was really interested in thinking about. And so, but going back now to the paper about the Gaussian mixture models and with what we did in that problem, 
Uh, before I go there, is there any questions on this model? Uh, on uh, this? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. So is D just the number of like moments that you can detect or like because my when i'm reading it i'm seeing that like if you decide to to try to recover d moments it increases your sample complexity exponentially is that correct um uh, uh, exponential in terms of d yes but uh, it's not really about recovering the moment it's about recovering this the the parameters but the thing is, sometimes you need to have higher order moments to recover this parameter. And it turns out that on, on this information theoretical sense, on this sample complexity part, is the best you can do. You can do, you really need those samples. You don't, you can do nothing. You can find the molecule with less samples. Does this okay. make sense? So D is determined by the, the problem that you have? Exactly. And that, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Like, for instance, if it was just a Gaussian, and you had to estimate the mean. The mean you only needed the first moment. But then if you needed the first and the, the mean and the covariance, uh, then you'd need two other moments. But now if you're a Gaussian mixture model where you have the mean, the covariance of more than one center, you do need third order moments because the first and the second don't give you enough information. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Could I just clarify? This is for cryo EM. So you're trying to recover this three-dimensional structure, right? So the the when you say sample complexity, it's uh, it's of you somehow are parameterizing that three-dimensional structure and then recovering those parameters, right? Exactly. So one way to reparameterize it is is thinking about Fourier Fourier in Fourier space. So okay. in Fourier space and like in, using spherical harmonics, things get more easier to understand. So what people do is parameterize these molecules in, in by spherical harmonics, and now you can really write what is spherical, what is this spherical, how this projection works in terms of the images itself. So the samples itself are projections of the 3D molecules over 2D dimensions, and uh, you can think of in Fourier space what that corresponds to. That's what people do in practice. But just a quick follow-up, I would have expected the sample complexity would depend on the model order. If you use more spherical harmonics, I would have thought you would need more samples to recover that, but I don't see that in the expression here. Is it, is it there so somewhere? It, so the expression would, would be buried in this norm of the moments, which okay. I agree, like the more higher order, um, the higher, higher you, you need the uh, the higher order you need of these frequencies, the, the more sample you need, of course. Um, this, is, this expression is more about like this interplay between the noise, just the noise of the, the Gaussian noise that you have in the images in I and mean, can assume the, the noise is Gaussian, and, um, and the number of samples you need. Okay. And it's, it's then given by these moments and then we still have to analyze even what this norm looks like in prior EM and then how that depends on like how many frequencies you can estimate that that's more questions that is still a little bit open because the cryo EM problem is, is quite hard to to ask, to figure out these things even for simpler problems sometimes it's hard okay, thanks um, I'm sorry I have a quick question uh, is this a small sigma the variance of the noise Yes, the noise of uh, the images. Okay, I think that uh, this uh, the right hand side, uh, this sigma to the minus two d. Uh, oh well, it's uh, trend dependency on the d will depend on like whether sigma is larger than one or smaller than one. This is for big for for big sigma. This is uh, oh. Oh, right. so this holds for large sigma. Yes, otherwise it doesn't. Uh... Okay, okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, so if you uh, actually that's a, a other thing I can talk about that offline because um, the moments appear when you do it uh, online, but what if Sigma is not too big? What is the right thing to do? And I have some ideas for that. Or like what happens for different Sigma on different regimes of Sigma? That's an interesting question. 
And so, but going back now to the Gaussian mixture model, which was the, the main focus of uh, this talk and uh, a little bit on how we can do mixture method of moments in a efficient way. And let me explain a little bit more about some other tensor products. Um, I saw, talked about these products of vectors which give you symmetric tensors, but you can have other kinds of products. You can do a vector with a matrix and that gives you a tensor of order three, which is not symmetric, or you can do two times a vector times a matrix and that gives you a tensor of order four, and you can do all kinds of products. Uh, but now some of these products are not symmetric, and so there's this nice way of symmetrizing. You can sum over all permutations, over de factorial permutations of your tensor, and now you get the symmetric tensor. It's very similar to matrices. If you have a matrix, you can do A plus A transpose divided by two, and that gives you a symmetric matrix. Um, you can do the same thing with tensors. There's a faster way to do this that doesn't take de factorial time. You can do this in like D log D time. Um, and this is an example of symmetrization of a tensor of order three with one of the products that I did before. And so the, the reason I'm talking about this symmetrization is that the moments of this Gaussian can be written in a nicer way if you think about the symmetrization operator. Uh, how are we in terms of time? Yeah, like 20 minutes still. Okay. So, Going back to, to the discussion model. So the first thing we did and in this paper is about actually getting a nice formula for the Gaussian for the moment. The, for even for a tensor, like for a, a arbitrary order, it, it was really not known a nicer formula to get uh, the, this the more the, this moment of the tensor. And there's re this really nice way to, to work to write the this desired order moment of a, a Gaussian using this symmetrizing operator. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, context, so the first moment is just the mean, and then the second moment is just mu mu transpose times plus sigma, and the third moment is mu to the cube plus some term that depends on mu and sigma. And so this before people have figured out that this moment was like mu times sigma in one direction, and then sigma times mu on the other direction, then there's something where mu is in the middle, which is what you get when you symmetrize this mu times sigma tensor. And so this is something that, um, this, this is a problem that people know, for instance, for tensor of order three, but they didn't know how to write in a nice way. And now there's this really nice way to just apply the symmetrizing operator. And, uh, and this formula is, uh, we only saw it written in some, some places for, for lower order, but it's a really simple and nice way to write this tensor formula. And now that, uh, and by the way, if you look at the formula, there's this term here that might not be familiar, but for people that are used to these mom moments of Gaussians, this is the 2 kth moment of an invariant Gaussian. And, uh, and so, with the Gaussian mixture model, the, the moments are very similar. The, it's a mixture of the moments for each of Gaussian on, on the center. And now, if we wanted to form the tensors, we, we were OK, because we already knew how to form these tensors. We knew how to form the empirical tensors. So we could just form these tensors and then do some gradient descent on these very big tensors. It would be uh, very hard to calculate, but we could probably do that. It would take long time that we could do that. And uh, so a little bit about, let me skip a little bit on this, but so there's this correspondence between symmetric tensors and homogeneous polynomials that can be really useful in proving some of these ideas. And uh, with this, we can reduce the moment of a, a Gaussian, a, a multivariate Gaussian as the this moment of a univariate Gaussian, whereas the Z is this polynomial variable and now that you, you get this for a polynomial, and then you can go from the polynomial back to tensors. And this is basically the main idea behind this 
proofs. But now what I really wanted to introduce is this idea of the implicit optimization. And so we have this uh, empirical moment, which is the average of the x i to the power of d. And we have this model moment, which is uh, the expectation over when x is from some Gaussian mixture model with parameters lambda j, mu j, and sigma j of uh, the, the expected of x to the power of d. And now we want to minimize this norm. So what we're going to do is uh, use some manipulations of tensors using formal that we know. Um, before I, I carry on, there's a little bit more formal of tensors that I need to talk about. So if we have the multiplication between two rank one tensors, they really simplify in a nicer way. So if you have a to the cube times b to the cube, it's AIJIK times BI with JDK. So you can now group the AIs with AI with BI, AJ with BJ, BK with BK, AK with BK, and you get the dot product of AI to B, the dot product of I and A and B cubed. And so what, why is this a nice thing? Because on the left, we have the product between the tensors. But on the right, you just have the dot product between two vectors, which is easier to calculate to the power of three. And this is in two in general. If you have a tensor, a rank one tensor times another rank one tensor, it's equal to the, their dot product to the power of d. And there's other things you can do. If you have a, 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 tensor, a rank one tensor times a matrix and a, a vector, things also distribute by 12. And the, so using these kind of ideas, you can maybe, or you can calculate the dot product faster. And so one thing that we have to remember um, is that the empirical moment is just a sum of rank ones. And so this sum of rank ones is going to really allow us to use these ideas that we just put here to calculate dot products faster instead of forming these models. And so going back to our optimization problem, so if we have uh, this, uh, this if you want to minimize this norm, you can write this as the norm of the first tensor plus the norm of the second minus their dot product. And then the first one doesn't matter because it doesn't depend on the parameters of the Gaussian mixture model. So we're going to take it out. And then there's this, match, this dot product between the moments and my to the D to the power of D and J to the power of D. And then this dot product between rank ones and the moments. And so we reduce the problem to just calculating these ones in a faster way that doesn't, so that we don't need to form this very big test. And let me explain how we do this for the um, dot, for the dot, dot product between the X side to the power of D and the moment, we, I'll give the example of the tensor of order three. So the tensor of the moment of a Gaussian of order three looks like this. So if you do the, their dot product between X side to the cube, one thing we can do is that, so the symmetrization operator is self-adjoint, um, meaning that uh, you can put sim on the other side, but then x side to the cube is a symmetric tensor, so you can take it out. And so now you have uh, x side cube times mu j cube, you, you have uh, the formula that we put before. This one, I also put the formula for it, and it basically ends up being just the dot product of x side mu j, cube plus x i transpose sigma j x i. And so you can calculate this a priori, and then you just use this for, for different orders. And so and uh, an important part is that you can calculate now this dot product without forming these tensors. It's just the dot product of x i and e j, and the dot product of x i transpose times sigma j times x i. Um, so this is for the dot product for the Oh, okay. There's a typo here. For the moments, is uh, a little bit more hard, harder, but not too much. So you can think of the moments as the expectations of uh, the the dot product between the expectations of two random variables that are independent. Now, because it's the dot product between expectations, you can put the expectation of the dot products because it's a linear operator, assuming that the xi and the xj are independent. And now this is just the dot product between two rank one tensors, which you can just take it to be the dot product to the power of D. 
And now you can think this is a weak moment of the univariate variable that, uh, that has a distribution equal to X, Xi transpose times Xj. And then we, to calculate these things, we, we actually can get a, a formal for the cumulants of this random variable. And to go from the cumulants to the moments, you use bell polynomials. And now you can calculate this, this thing, these things. And, and uh, so we know how to calculate everything now. We don't need to form the tensors. And so we, we can solve this overcoming the curse of dimensional. So we can minimize these moments without forming these tensors. The times, the, the number of operations are similar to expectation maximization, to normal op operations, you need to do this. So it's an algorithm that can be used as an, as an alternative to expectation maximization. Uh, and I talked about calculating function values, but we can also calculate the gradients and we have nice formulas for them. And we can also make stochastic formulation if you need, because this, uh, you have the, this empirical moment is the average of xi to the, the power of d, and you can just take some batch of the xi's and do some kind of stochastic rate descent on this as well. And um, so this is uh, all nice things, and then there's some problems we, we got in the way. One that was already mentioned a, a little bit here by Jeff was that, uh, so if we only look at moments of some order, there's this ambiguity that you have. So this is an example of two, two Gaussian mixture models that have uh, the same third moment. They don't have the first moment, the same first moment in general for different mu ones and mu two, but they do have this, the same third moment. And this is true, like for, you can always find two Gaussian mixture models that have exactly the same deep moment. And so you need to use more than one moment. Uh, we have a nice way to do this. So if you if you append a constant to the end of each observation, now you're going to have um, a vector of dimension the the samples have dimension n plus one, and now the scaling that you get from the mu and the sigma, you know that mu should be a one in the end. It should have a w in the end. So you can use this to to fix this gamma j that to some ambiguity and basically it fixed the problem and, and, um, and solve this. And the good thing is that we have nice formulas for the gradient that you can use now in this problem as well and do the calculations in a implicit and fast way without having to weigh different moments. You can also weigh different moments and that would also work well. But so, but this idea also ends up being a weighted combination of all the moments from one to the other. And uh, and so we end up including all the moments in this implicit way. And uh, there's also a different uh, aspect of this problem where suppose you have this um, covariance that you know. So this, uh, so you think of prior EM. You do know what the noise looks like because you can just look at a part that doesn't have um, a molecule. And you can look at the noise there. So you really know, low, know what the noise looks like. So when you know a covariance of the noise, you can use some of the ideas similar to what I explained to the bias the, the moment is. And uh, for instance, if you do this in a Gaussian mixture model where the covariance is fixed and is the same for every center, you can use this to actually get uh, a low order, a low rank tensor. And so you now can reduce this to low rank tensor decomposition. And uh, we also explained how you can do this. And we, we, we also know how to do this implicitly. And we also have a, a similar idea for this for fixing the scaling ambiguity using this augmented variable. And uh, so I'm going to, OK, this is. Uh, skipping a, a slide, but I'm going to talk about numerical results now. Um, so a comparison, so for numerical results, we compare with the EM, which is the state of the art for learning Gaussian mixture models. And so it has some problems. So EM is like sensitive to initialization and is sensitive to overlapping Gaussians. And so 
we're not saying that this is better than EM, of course it's not, but it, it might be an alternative in some cases. When, when EM is problem, as a problem, you can say, okay, let's try something else. Huh? You might be inclined to try this thing, which has a, some, uh, a, a computational uh, complexity that's similar to EM. And so we observed that uh, uh, in some cases, or, or methodal moments can even find the things which have higher likelihood than EM. So what happens here is that EM got stuck before finding the, the good maximum, while that didn't happen with the methodal moments. Got also finds uh, a le as less error for lambda, for mu, the sigma, both of them are very bad at estimating with this number of samples. But uh, we really get things that make uh, more sense with these um, method of moments. And this is for a lower noise scenario. We increase the noise and then in this example, EM got more log likelihood, but we still got better, sorry, excuse me, but less error for lambda and for mu. And again, both are bad for, for estimating sigma. Um, and so to conclude, this is, um, this is uh, in this talk, I talk a little bit about the sample complexity and how in these low signal to noise ratio problems, on these problems with a very high noise, the, the sample complexity is defined by the moments of the data. And then uh, we also gave a, a way to use this um, method to apply the method of moments for Gaussian to learning Gaussian mixture models, but in a way that is efficient and doesn't need to form the, the, the tensor. So it avoids the course of dimensionality and the, the exponential dependence on the moment. And so some things that we're thinking about working in the future is, so there's some impl implementation details that we want to, to explain better because there's a lot of implementation details that need to be go over in this problem. There's also, we also want to think about the optimization landscape, but compare this to the maximum likelihood because we see that we're getting less, um, the, we saw in our experiments that um, this would be the, the optimization would, would get less stuck than EM. And so we wonder why, why that is happening. Uh, we want also to understand what is the variance of this estimator and try to bound the number of samples and try to a good weighting of different or moment orders. That's uh, an interesting problem. And uh, and uh, a nice direction also is to try to apply these implicit ideas in other kinds of problems with the method of moments and uh, similar things. Uh, and that's it for this work. How, how much time do I have right now? A few more minutes, yeah. Four or five would be on. Okay. And uh, so I have some extra slides on this sensor decomposition work that I did besides this. So. There's this connection between, um, and so I'll just go over it in a few seconds. But so there's this connection between moment tensors and uh, tensor decomposition. For instance, if you have a Gaussian mixture model, but the sigmas are actually quite small, you get that this uh, covariance is approximately lambda j times mu j to the power of d. So it's like approximately low rank. So you can try to use tensor decomposition to decompose this. So we worked on tensor decomposition and we have an algorithm for symmetric tensor decomposition that is quite fast, like 10 around on average 10 times faster than the state of the art. Um, we also have some nice mathematical guarantees for the algorithm and we're working right now on this version of the algorithm for the moment tensors, again, using this implicit decomposition. And so, I, I think this is a, a really cool algorithm because so if you want to decompose a moment tensor implicitly with order dimension 500 and order six, only if you wanted to form this tensor, you have to save it in memory. Only saving it in memory would take 125 pentabytes, which is twice the memory of the entire collection of Netflix movies. But because our method doesn't really calculate this tensor and has this this nice idea using these implicit ideas that I told before, you can actually do this 
in 3.5 seconds. It, the, the, decompose this very big tensor without actually forming it, just looking at the sample itself. And with the error, there's quite small. Error. And that is it. Any questions? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting seminar. Uh, before uh, I'll open up for questions in just a second, I do want to mention that um, there are still openings. Since he's visiting remotely, we set up times to meet with him both today and tomorrow, and there's openings on the schedule tomorrow. If you're interested in meeting with him, let me know. I can share the, actually, I'll just put the link into the chat right now uh, if anybody's interested in sign up to meet with Joao. Um, so with that, I'll open it up for questions now. Oops. I'll ask a little one. What was the acronym SPM in your last section that you went over there? I didn't quite catch what was the name of the algorithm method. It, it's subspace. So the, the we call the algorithm subspace power method subspace because power. it works yeah. by like applying a power method to these subspace uh, systems. So you form by like finding a subspace. And so I think it's catchy, SPM. It's a nice name okay. and a short name for it. And so it's what we call the algorithm. I have a question. Uh, hi, Jal. So there's a paper from a few years ago on tensor methods for latent variable models. And it looks at Gaussian mixture models and hidden Markov models and, and others, um, maybe even neural networks. I don't know. But you know, it's got Anand Kumar and Daniel Su and some other people. So how does your work relate to theirs? So they they think about tensor decomposition and they actually relate to the, the, what they go over is a lot of application of tensor decomposition, how, how tensor decomposition can be used to solve this problem. And it's a really interesting part, paper. And uh, so my, my problem, I, or my, my talk relates to this because I really work on this tensor decomposition. So, one of this for a lot of the work of that paper is focused on symmetric density composition. So the algorithms for doing that are mostly most of them are based on numerical optimization. So you have this um, is uh, the model for low rank tensor. You can if you fix the rank, you can just write it as some optimization that you can solve for. Uh, this is an alternative algorithm to do, which can be quite fast and it's also robust to noise in a lot of cases. And he has some nice math behind it. But mm -hmm. basically, it is a, an algorithm to do tensor decomposition, where they focus mostly on the applications of tensor decomposition. Oh, I see. OK. OK. That makes sense. So are there any um, any scenarios where a practitioner might want to use your approach over EM? Yes. So, um, so what we think EM, so First, you can do it as like, okay, Yen didn't give something quite nice. Maybe let's try this thing, which, okay, it's a result. Okay, okay. Not a very good one. But so the re the part, the the problems where I think these, these method moments can be better is in problems where the um, centers really get uh, close to each other. Yen tends to get stuck in that. And I think the method moments might be better on that. Because, uh, on those cases, maybe these moments are going to be better in distinguishing what are the centers and figure out the comparisons as well, while the the M might get a little bit stuck on that. So yeah, I think that's some cases where the problem can be more useful. Okay. What choice? Of, what is the choice of D that you recommend? Is it three, or can you use higher values? So it depends on the number of parameters you do. My my recommendation is to try lower, always mm -hmm. above two, because two is never enough for for like if you have full covariances, two is not enough, right? Mm -hmm. Do three if you have really small number of parameters, but uh, do the smallest you can where you still get something nice. So three and four is the typical. But like do you ever, I mean, do you ever need to go up to 
like 10 or higher? You might, if you have, um, if you have um, very low dimensional, um, so imagine your samples out of dimension two, mm -hmm. then the, ten, the order, tensor orders really don't get you a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And uh, you really know you need to go to higher order, but then then it's my question is if you really need to go up to order ten or something, is this really get? I, I, I'm not sure if this method is is going to be the best because then <laughs> this desired order you you're getting something to the variance of order ten, and so maybe it's not the best thing. So you can try to augment your data. That's something I tried on in my work, which is like. You have this data in two dimensions. Maybe you can like write a kernel where you project you you map this data to a higher dimensional set. Now in these higher dimensions, you can try to find these clusters now using these Gaussian mixture models. Um, and now in these higher dimensional, you don't need so many higher moments. And uh, so what this, this is like this is a um, a way to try to do this. So. You take your data, you augment it, and then this higher dimensional thing is something you can now use these lower order tensors to still do it. And so that that's something I haven't explored that a lot, but we, we were working on this data set, which is very low dimensional. And so I was thinking, okay, maybe higher orders you can't really do that. So maybe it's better to use this idea of augmentation and try to. And I was experimenting with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, interesting talk. I'll ask one, I'm meeting you tomorrow, so I'll just keep to myself. The one more question right now, which is your kind of that main result you showed about the uh, kale divergence uh, around slide 22 or so, very interesting result. Um, the slide I think says it's cryo EM, but it looks like it's general. And so I'm just curious, is there anything specific about cryo EM? Um, no. So yeah. we started with cryo EM because there's this really high noise. And then we started seeing that uh, it was the moments in cryo EM. But then we noticed it's not specific to cryo EM. It's, uh, so first we thought, okay, it's specific to groups, to this group action. And then there's uh, this okay. result with the group action. But then it's not. You can also do this for Gaussian mixture model. Then we think we thought it was um, Gaussian noise, but it, it also it's also Turpenian kind of noise, which is interesting. Like you can really, like it, you can really model this in a way that um, it also works for any kind of noise. And uh, so it's true for for any kind of problem. It's something I I I want to write a paper where this is more visible because I think it's an important thing because. Uh, can be useful in a lot of problems. There's problems where we don't know anything about the solution or something. Maybe even, so one application of this could be, for instance, channel capacity of some problems where you don't even know anything about the channel capacity. This might get you the, the, the first derivative in terms of like mm. zero information to sum. It gets you like the first derivative on the channel capacity, but like you can try to solve it like that. So. Because this is really true for a lot of problems, not only not only cryo and all, all different kinds of noise. So you, it is also true for Bernoulli noise and for for um, Poisson noise. So for Bernoulli and Poisson, I I really even know what something about it that uh, that is nice. But anyways, it's true for for any kind of noise in, in a way that that this has to be defined, that there's some technical conditions there, of course, but it's true basically for, for a lot of models. But yeah. I really think, I, 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 I think this should go out because it's, it's nice and it's not known for a lot of people. I, I think it's an awesome result, but uh, I, I need to take time to write a paper where this can be out in a way that people can understand. But this is true for anybody. Thank you. Anybody else have any uh, last question? Hearing none, this is Zoom after all. Thank you very much, Joao. I really appreciate the very interesting presentation. I look forward to talking to you more tomorrow. Okay, thank you. See you there, bye-bye.